Well, welcome. We're right in the, the last end of the election season. And we have somebody who we want you to take time, understand, get to know. So we'll start with an introduction. Thanks, Al. Ryan Fatman running for the state senate, November's election. I think the question you always start off with is, why as a Milfordian should you vote for me? You've uh, done well, your homework. Yeah, absolutely. And the easy answer for me is, you know, if you want Massachusetts to be an affordable and an accountable place to live, um, I'd like your vote. And the reason is, you know, just some experiences I've had as a state representative. I got elected in 2010, got reelected in 2012. I've served on my hometown board of selectmen prior to that for five years and probably like most people got really frustrated as a local official and consequently as a state representative watching the way Beacon Hill works. Um, watching local aid get devastated year after year. In the last eight years, we've seen local aid decrease by $500 million, and yet the state budget has increased by $7 billion. To me, we'd make our communities a priority and a big investment. Um, and at the same time, we've seen reforms that could help us save money and bring back accountability to Massachusetts go out the wayside. Uh, for example, I said this last time I was on the show, my wife and I got married a year ago, moved in together, you know, we're surprised. We had to give out our social security number to set up our internet, our cable, and our telephone. And the reason why we were surprised by that is our policies with regards to Massachusetts, where you don't need a social security number for things like welfare, housing, health care, any sort of government assistance. In fact, according to the law, you don't need to prove you're a Massachusetts resident. And so when you think about this and you talk about money being wasted and local aid being cut and budget increasing, there's a tremendous amount of fraud and abuse in the system, and that needs to be cleaned and wiped away with. And the way we get there is by saying common sense reforms. Yes, you must have a social security number to get access to these programs. 36 other states do it. We should too. Um, putting a photo ID on the EBT card. Now they've started to do that as a pilot program in the law, but it should be a statute, it should be solid. And third, making sure you can't use that card for things like alcohol, tobacco products, lottery tickets, gambling, cruises, tattoos. You know, these are some of the issues that I've been campaigning on, on reform. And it's the thing that I think Massachusetts residents, especially people from Milford, see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's what I've heard on the campaign trail, and I'm running to try to change it. Let's take a couple of the thoughts you just brought up. EBT cards. Now, I don't quite understand that if I want to go on an airplane, they won't let me on without a government-approved form of ID. Right. Uh, can't Which, by the way, is no longer a Massachusetts I was say, license. And isn't that all of a sudden now we're being told that very soon we can't use mass licenses exactly. for that? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Very true. But regardless, you sit there and say, wait a minute, if I want to go on a plane, if I want to go into federal buildings, a lot of them won't let me in without an ID. Why is it wrong to say if you want free government aid, the card you use has to have your picture on it? Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think the emphasis should be these are good programs. You know, these programs are meant to help people who have fallen on the wayside. You know, I've had the opportunity over the last uh, seven months since March to knock on 13,146 doors in this district campaigning for the state senate. Uh, my shoes are getting worn out and I will say I am tired. But I get energized by the stories that I hear every single day. And one in particular, you know, I met a woman who had a minimum wage job. And what's even better about this story is that, you know, she was a legal Massachusetts immigrant. She became a United States citizen 11 years ago. It took her 20 years to bring her entire family over to this country from Brazil. And, you know, you listen to her story and how much money she spent and how when she fell on tough times, there was a program there for her, the EBT uh, program, that she could rely on to get up off of her knees because she needed help. You know, that's a great thing. But what she is frustrated by is somebody who comes to the country illegally and is able to get access to these programs when they really shouldn't be able to do that or when they can get a job that pays lower than the minimum wage and she gets priced out of the market. When I talked to her, she was currently looking for a job. She had lost hers. 
You know, and I think that those are the kinds of things that everyday people from Milford are experiencing, especially the immigrant population here. And there's a large and thriving immigrant population, and many people who have chosen to become United States citizens or are legally here on a work visa or student visa and just trying to make it. But then they see people who come here the wrong way, and they get frustrated by that, as do just everyday Milfordians. And that is something that I think absolutely needs to change. I want to make sure we stop the process of illegal immigration and stop what attracts people. And I think that starts with you know putting a photo ID on the EBT card, requiring a social security number, so we know that you're a United States citizen or a legal Massachusetts resident. Now, the only downside I've heard that mm -hmm. made sense to me was people can't afford an ID. Mm -hmm. And my question to you, Mr. Legislator, would be can't you let them go to the DMV? Sure. Right? Yeah. Subsidize it. Put ten dollars or whatever the registry charges you. Yeah. One one time you get your EBT card. Yeah. You got an extra ten bucks on it. Right. And that can only be used to go get a photo to put on the photo ID. Wouldn't that eliminate it? You know, it, it, it would be a good idea. And that's something that I support. I've supported finding revenue to make sure that we can support indigent people who are, eight, who are you know, really unable to necessarily take care of themselves, but could get that access to an ID so that they could use it for voting or for like signing up for welfare programs, whatever it might be. We are a compassionate society and we always want to help people. That is the greatness of our country. Now again, I, I just think of my own life. I sign up for PSA, you know, a health program that takes money out pre-tax. Mm -hmm. They give me a nice little card. I go to the CVS, I can buy prescriptions, I can buy aspirin. If I try buying candy mm. or junk, the card says no. Right. So when people tell me they can't control what the EBT cards are used for. I mean, maybe I'm a little slow, but I'm confused. How can you control me not buying a candy bar at CVS with money that's mine? Right. They will bounce it. They'll say, I'm sorry, sir, you can charge these eight items to your card, but these three, your candy bar and your coffee, don't qualify. Well, we absolutely can do it. And the real question is political will. You know, Massachusetts is a big state, has a lot of different interests. When you get closer to Boston, they have a totally different opinion than a lot of the people out here. And I would be a state senator that says, while I respect your opinion in Boston, I'm going to represent the people of my district. And the people in my district are really frustrated by this abuse and this fraud. And that we're going to take measures to put in place to make sure it doesn't happen. Because I've never met somebody who's unwilling to help another American or legal well, immigrant. Right. Nobody is going to say, I won't buy infant formula for a child who's hungry. Correct. But I don't know that I'm real comfortable paying for his mom or dad to be having a cigarette and some Jack Daniels. Yep. You know, and I'm being facetious, but there are certain things that when you say you help somebody up off their feet. Absolutely. Food, you know, basics. Yep. Yes. Yeah. But when I hear how much is being spent on other stuff. Yeah. It just doesn't feel that I'm helping you get better if I'm paying for your tobacco. Yeah, one of the people I met on the campaign trail back in uh, July was a guy named Chris. And uh, Chris was from Hopedale. And you know, as I approached his house, it, you, he kind of saw his overgrown lawn. And I just noticed that, you know, not something I really paid too much attention to. But I knocked on Chris's door and he came out. And, you know, we got to talk and I gave him my little spiel. And he said, you know, this sounds great. You know, I, I needed help and I couldn't get it. They said I made too much money. Um, and, you know, I was making about $400 a week. My wife had lost her job. Then she got cancer. And all I was looking for was just a little bit extra padding to get me through that week. And she said, the reason why my lawn has overgrown, which you probably noticed, I had to sell my lawnmower. Um, he couldn't afford it anymore. And so that's an everyday struggle that I see people have all the time. And he went on and expounded upon some of those struggles, not just putting food on the table, but simple things, you know, like having a haircut. And you think to yourself, holy cow, you know, this, this person is really struggling. And I've heard that story time and time and time again. Uh, I met a guy who works for Xerox, and he told me that, 
you know, he can be sent with his business. He said, I have a great job, and I really am grateful for that. But I can be sent to anywhere in New England at the split second of me being told. And no one pays me to drive to Starro, New Hampshire, you know, because I'm told to do it, and I get a salary, and that salary covers. He said, of course, on my vehicle I can write off the mileage, but I don't get a paid stipend. And I think that that's where there's a disconnect between the people who serve on Beacon Hill and the people they're serving. You know, politicians in Massachusetts get paid up to $100 a day to drive to work, in addition to a full-time salary. And so when you see the gas tax go up and it get tied to inflation and it goes up forever with no one voting on it, which, by the way, is what we get elected to do, to vote, um, you see this guy who works for Xerox paying his own way. And to me, that's not right. You know, we're supposed so to have... Now, this whole automatic indexing. Sure. I know this old man's opinion. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take money out of my pocket, you stand up, look me in the face, vote to take money out of my pocket. Yep. What's your position on letting taxes automatically increase with inflation? I am against it. I have voted against it. I am also... A Tell us why. Um, I think that we were founded on the principle no taxation without representation. I think that when you tie taxes to inflation, there's no accountability. You know, if you want to tell me how my money's being spent and why it needs, why a tax needs to go up, make that argument. Bring that debate to the House floor, to the Senate floor. But to just basically take an argument and sweep it right off, I think that flies in the face of just about everything that our country was founded on. And so as a principle, I think it's wrong. But in addition to that, you know, when people vote to raise the gas tax, tie it to inflation, and yet they don't pay it, there's a big disconnect there. And to me, I, you know, when I got elected in 2010 as a state representative, I promised. I promised several things, but I said, hey, I'm going to hold myself accountable. I will never take that money, that travel reimbursement on the taxpayer's dime. And if I do, you shouldn't vote for me. Because this is supposed to be government of the people, by the people, for the people, not above the people. And now, that the logic that we're not really paying you guys, I mean, if you took House of Representatives down in D.C., mm -hmm. Their salaries are slightly more in line with mm -hmm. what people would say are good salaries. Mm -hmm. How do you answer when they say, well, some of these little perks are to offset the fact that you're not really getting huge salaries to represent us? You know, I knew what I was getting into and what I signed up for. And so I decided that it wasn't going to be for me to take those political perks. In fact, most people actually decide not to take them. Um, we've seen a trend of the legislators not doing that. And a lot of times, actually, legislators have other jobs. So this is a supplemental income a lot of times. For me, this is what I do full time. When I decided to run, I said, I'm going to do this for a period of time, and then I'll move on and let somebody else step up to the plate. I don't believe that people should be serving in office for two or three decades. I just don't. I don't think it's what our founding fathers wanted. Um, I, I pledged the first time I ran, I'd serve uh, six terms, 12 years, and then I'd reevaluate and probably let somebody else step up. Um, to me, that's sort of the founding of this country, and that's the way the principle should be. I understand, you know, if you think that the salary needs to be more to get more people interested in the position, well, then increase the salary. But I don't think you need to have a law that was on the books that says, you know, when we had horse and buggies and we used to travel in the Boston that way, that you should be reimbursed when you travel. It's just, it's a disconnect, and I don't think that that's right. Well, I mean, I can more see it. You know, we've got our representative, Joe Kennedy. Mm -hmm. We expect him to have a place in Washington because he's got to live there. Mm -hmm. But we really don't want him to give up his place in Massachusetts. Correct. So, you know, I can more see some of those perks tying to saying if you're expected to keep two residences. Yeah. Okay, there's travel in between. I mean, I can see that, but we really don't expect you to keep a place in Boston, do we? Exactly. And uh, what is it? 45 miles from my house to Boston and back, you know, and then so 90. Well, a lot miles. of us did that for many years going into Boston. Exactly. And, the, you know, it's apples and oranges when you're comparing the United States Congress to Beacon Hill. Um, you know, when Joe Kennedy goes down to D.C., you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, should someone pay for that trip down there? He was elected and he's traveling a very long way to well, do it. I don't it. think it's reasonable to expect that he only keeps or he keeps two houses. Right, exactly. You no, know, I and, agree. And again, I, I look back at industry and when I went to Paris, mm -hmm. the company subsidized it. Right. 
you know, because I had a house here. Yep. And they're asking me to live in Paris for four years, so yep. they subsidized it. Absolutely. That feels right. Yep. When I was commuting to Brighton, Boston, yep. um, nobody really said you should have two pl not that I would want two places to be 30 miles away. Right, right, exactly. But is there any other perks that make sense that come along with well, Beacon I, Hill? You know, they, they pay politicians a lot of times in Massachusetts for office expenses. Um, they pay them for committee chairs. You know, there's there's sort of tiers. And, and so the base salary of $61,000, a lot of times you find people making upwards of eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. Um, and that's a pretty good salary. That ain't I mean, bad at all. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a lot see. different. 90000 puts you at the top 15 or 20 percent of the country? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think most people even listening here right now would say $61,000 is a pretty decent salary. Yeah, I'm not going to be on the welfare rolls with that. Yeah, no, you're not. And, uh, you know, that's why I say these political perks that the paying politicians who drive to work, they shouldn't be there. They should go away. I've sponsored legislation, hasn't really gotten too far. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to do, and I will do if I'm elected to the state Senate, I'm going to put this to the people. You know, the reason why we're voting on the gas tax right now is because of people like myself and others who volunteered their time in November, December, and January to go out and collect signatures. I collected 2,000 signatures so that the people could have a say on this. Because, to be quite frank, I mean, the legislature decided to do this lickety split, and no one was really paying attention to it. Um, so the people's voice has to be heard. Well, the same thing can be true of any issue. And so one of the pledges that I'd like to make is if I get elected, within the first three or four terms, I am going to try to put this on the ballot and have a constitutional amendment to get rid of it. There are about 200 legislators total in Massachusetts, and I believe the number of people who actually take it is about 60. So why is it that 140 people choose not to and 60 do that we still have it exist? The second thing is there's no accountability with this system. If I travel into Boston and um, I want to collect it, I just mark it a little, a little check off the box and say, yes, I traveled in. Well, there was a man, Fuster, who basically had to resign his seat because he was lying, you know, and, and he, wasn't, he was checking the boxes when he wasn't there. And that, there's no checks and balances on that system. Now, what's more scary, that he took $100 or that somebody making laws sold his integrity for $100? I, I think both are <laughs> scary. And the thing is, it's not just $100. It could be $100 a day. You know, so how many days there are, that could be $27,000 a year. You know, I think the top Still, guy. Still, I mean, for Ron, your family, your reputation, I mean, hey, I don't know what the price of my integrity is, Yeah, but it's going to be a big number. If I, I ever find I, it, you know, I want a place where I can buy an island, absolutely. own a continent. Yes. Then I'll think about it, maybe. But, but don't forget. We're dealing with Beacon Hill. You know, we've seen some of the things play out over the course of the last decade. You know, more speakers indicted than jobs created, and that's not a joke. You know, three in a row, and then a fourth who's in trouble right now, who's been, you know, in the crash. But, you know, to me, it, it goes back to the people. What, what are the people getting? Are there, is their voice being heard? And I point to, you know, the income tax reduction. Sixty percent of Massachusetts in the year 2000 voted to reduce their income tax, and yet... Where did that go? Yeah, nowhere. <laughs> You know, nowhere. And actually, it was stopped. Actually, Senator Moore was the guy who filed the legislation to stop it in the in the Senate. A lot of people don't know that. And um, instead of rolling it back from six and a quarter down to five percent, the legislature said, "No, we're not going to obey the people." You know, we're people with the government, not the other way around. When people, you know, vote, their voice shouldn't just be heard; it should be heeded. Are we being heard? I mean, one of no. the jokes about biotech being big in Massachusetts yeah. is that. Many of the legislators want to have the number one genetic project be a cross between a giraffe and a cow so it could eat in Metro West and give milk <laughs> in Boston. <laughs> you know, and you listen to it and you sit there and say, maybe there's some truth to this. Yeah, yeah. How do we get our voice heard so if the giraffe end is eating, yeah. that some of the milk stays here? Right. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that are really important is transparency and trying to bring accountability to government. You know, we've had debates on the House floor, on the Senate floor, to have 24 hours to read a bill. And that doesn't exist right now. You don't have 24 hours to read a bill. There's no rule that says you can or law. 
Um, there's been rules that say you should have seven hearings across the state any time that you want to raise taxes so that you can get input and in the ideas of the business community. That's a fantastic idea. Doesn't happen. Um, how about seven days just to hear what is in a tax proposal because we just raised taxes by $500 million last summer and part of that was a technology tax. A technology tax that subsequently was repealed because the business community was never approached about it. Legislature just did it, um, ignored a lot of people who are saying, wait a minute, you might want to take some time here to really think about this. And then we're shocked when, you know, there's all this uproar from the business community and said, you know, this is going to be a devastating tax. It's going to hurt jobs. It's going to hurt families. We're going to have to lay people off. And of course, had these rules been in place that most people vote against, to say 24 hours to read the bill, seven days you know, to see anything in a tax proposal, hearings across the state, doesn't happen. And that's, I think, what people get really disappointed by. And I think that, no, people are not being heard. But they have an awesome opportunity to be heard in this election. You know, it doesn't have to be this way. That's the thing. We have these things called elections. And on November 4th, people can go in there. And if they're happy with the way things are, then I'm probably not the guy to vote for. But if they think we can do better, if they think it's commonsensical to put, you know, a photo ID on an EBT card or, or even more, require that you must have a Social Security number to sign up for a welfare program or health care or whatever it might be, um, then I think we can do a lot better and I'd ask for their vote because Massachusetts has to do better. There's a lot of people depending on us as elected officials to try to get to that next step where it's an affordable and accountable state. That's exactly what I want to try to do. Rumor Central mm. tags you to some of this nasty campaign advertising only because it's picking on your opponent, so they assume it comes from you. Is, how do I put this? I mean, I'm being mean, but I'm going to ask you. Sure. Are you funding, are you behind any of this nasty mail I'm getting? If I had kind of that kind of money, I probably wouldn't be sitting here in politics right now. Um, no. And, um, you know, I don't anything nasty has come out about my opponent. Um, I know uh, Representative Fernandez has had some things come at him. I got one that kind of attacked both sides of, you know, John and um, Dick. But, you know, a lot of people are looking at this saying, well, it must be coming from the two opponents. Yeah, right. Well, no, it, I mean, I believe it comes from the Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance. And, um, you know, that's a 501c. They're not, they're not Milford, right? They're not Milford, no. Okay. And, um, 50, and you're not behind it? Nope. 501c4, no coordination. If you coordinate with those types of groups, you go to jail. That's no, I think what people, you know, all kidding aside, people mm. just want a straight answer. Yeah. You know, are you running for what you can do? You know, or are you, hey, my opponent sucks, I suck less, so vote for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, and when absolutely. you see these, I can't understand half of them. Because um, you, you hear about, well, they're, this person voted against the technicality. Of, maybe you can explain some of the bills that, you know, get up, amendments get put on. Yeah. And it seems like they're put on just to further political agendas? Sure. Well, I mean, just going to the topic of mail, I just sent out a piece of mail a few days ago. It just was a nice one. And it was very nice. And I haven't, an I haven't done anything negative. I mean, Senator Moore and I disagree on things. You know, he voted to raise taxes. I voted no. Um, you know, he voted to, you know, make sure that that gas tax was indexed to inflation. And right, I have so no problem up. with disagreements amongst gentlemen absolutely you know, amongst ladies and gentlemen I just sometimes when you see the stuff that isn't us yeah. it's not Milford to right. be mean-spirited has never won anybody that I know of in Milford yeah and I just wanted to give you a chance to clear the air yeah I think it would be great too maybe if you had that group come in who's sending the mail and talk to them because you know, sure, certainly they should have some explanation for why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, but in general, I think that accountability, transparency in government is a good thing. Um, you know, as you were talking about some of the procedural stuff and, you know, what happens a lot of times on Beacon Hill are games, you know, political games. And you see that on an elections bill where I would support voting with ID, you know, so that you have to have an ID when you show up to the polls. I think it's pretty common sense. I think most people think that's common sense. Well. 
you know, we propose an amendment to the elections bill, and the clerk, excuse me, someone from the uh, legislature will object to it. The clerk will say, oh, this is beyond the scope of the bill, and we can't do this. And so you sit there and you scratch your head and you say, well, how is it that vote with ID is beyond the, the scope, scope of, vote? of an election bill to vote? And so, you know, that's, I think, where some of these issues are, are coming from. Um, but, I mean, the idea that I have anything to do with it is a ridiculous notion. Well, no, I'm glad. Notion. And, you know, uh, and I would say the same thing to anybody running that comes on the show. Because mm -hmm. the objective here is not... I mean, I know your objective is to get people to vote for you. Right. Mine is to get people to know who you are. Right. So they can have an informed opinion and make an informed decision as to who they want to vote for. Right. When I see negative stuff in Milford, you know, it's technical term is poo. Yeah. And I just don't like poo landing on my front yard. Right. So I'm glad that you have nothing to do with it. And it you've makes not me feel seen better. anything negative from me. No. I saw the nice one you sent said no benefits for illegal immigrants that's what i've been campaigning hard on you know making sure massachusetts is not tax Massachusetts because i think that's the direction we're heading especially you know martha coakley is a democratic nominee now and um you know sh she's a democrat's candidate uh, she says technically it's not illegal to be illegal in massachusetts well you know charlie baker and i have totally different ideas it is illegal to be illegal in massachusetts and when people come here illegally, of course we want them to become United States citizens if they can, just the right way. And we shouldn't be belaboring the subject by, you know, or even slowing it down by offering benefits to people who shouldn't be here and giving no incentive but to become U.S. citizens. But are pulling people in? Let me put you on the spot. Again, I'll be mean. Should we give a discount to illegal aliens' children to go to our universities? No. Period. I mean, and there's been votes on that in the legislature. I voted no. Um, you know, I have that on my L pieces saying. I have a no. problem saying if there's a kid, an American citizen from Rhode Island, wants mm -hmm. to go to UMass, they'd be better off saying, I'm illegal. Yeah. Let me pay in state rates. Because if they admit they're from Rhode Island or from York or outside whatever sphere, we're going to charge them full rates. Yeah. I, I just can't get over that I would put somebody not American ahead of somebody American. Right. Yeah, it, no way. That makes sense to me. It, it is very common sense. Uh, you know, this is a principle that I think, you know, we have to build our society upon, that, you know, when you're a resident of Massachusetts legally living here, you come first. And I think there's a lot of people who don't feel that way. They well, don't I, feel like they've been first. I don't doubt that when my grandfather came here, mm. they asked him, you want to work? probably said I don't know you want to eat he goes yeah work mm. he understood yeah if he wants to eat he works he's here legally he goes through the motions and then good citizen right to me there doesn't seem anything wrong with that formula yeah no I, I agree with that completely and I think you know there's another formula that would work well in this state and that that is to try to make sure that you know we have some semblance of going back to our health care system that we had you know th there's breaking news today is that it's going to cost the commonwealth of massachusetts one billion dollars one billion dollars to fix our health care problem but i thought uh, we had a system that worked we did and then we changed it and there's no question about that we changed it there was a vote on june 19th 2013 and you know, some people are going to say, oh, well, it didn't really change much. We were just kind of trying to comply with the standards that the Affordable Care Act set out for Massachusetts. Well, the reality is we could have got a waiver. You know, Massachusetts should get a waiver from the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. It hasn't worked here. It hasn't been a good system. Now, some people say, well, what do you mean it doesn't work here? Because isn't that what we have? Like, isn't that, didn't Mitt Romney create this? Didn't the legislature? Well, they created something that was unique to Massachusetts. Don't forget, we had about 94, 95% of the people insured already, and maybe a little bit lower, 93% of the people insured, the highest in the country. And we basically insured for 5% of the population to make sure that, you know, if they went to the emergency room, if they needed care, they could get it. And that was the Massachusetts health care law. And we supplanted that and changed it, changed the standards on June 19th, 2013. 
and opted out of the Massachusetts plan and into the federal plan. Well, I can tell you my first experience hmm. was less than pleasant. Yeah. My mother, who's been in this country legally for 70, 77 years that she's been in this country, she needs a little help. Mm -hmm. And what they told me was she made too much money to qualify. Right. Because she had her Social Security, and then she's got two little pensions, $300 a month each, hmm. and it put her $150 over the $2,100 limit. Right. So she's sitting there at $2,300, and they're saying, oh, you make too much. Yeah. She, she just needs somebody to be with her during the day. Yeah. Well, they've got to pay five to 6000 a month to do that because the new Obamacare game says she makes too much money. Now, how they expect a person who's worked her whole life, paid into the system her whole life, never taken unemployment or welfare? I mean, I don't know how their math works, but 6000 or 5300 mm. doesn't go into 2300 very easily. No. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, luckily, we take care of it. She's in our family. We take care of her, but that's not a trivial amount. I mean, you know, you start saying five grand a month. Yeah. $60,000 a year is not trivial. Oh, no, definitely not. But it, Obamacare is supposed to be better? No. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, unfortunately, there's been victims everywhere. You have the first victim who lost their insurance, who were promised they could keep it. You have the second victim who have seen their premiums go up, and then the third who's seen their deductibles go up. And, you know, it's just not good, and it didn't have to be this way. And it's a huge difference between Senator Moore and I. He voted, it, he voted to make it this way, and I said, let's keep the plan we have. But wait a minute, he was one of the architects of the Massachusetts one that worked, I thought. Would have been nice to keep it that way, but he voted on June 19th. It might have been a different date in the Senate. In the House, it was 19th, 2013, but we voted to change it. We voted to increase the standards. Deval Patrick came out and said that the people who had health insurance for six years under the old standards who lost it, he said, well, they're just free riders, that their insurance was no good. So it was good for six years. But all of a sudden, when we voted to implement the Obamacare Affordable Care Act system, it was no longer good. That's a ridiculous notion. And, um, you know, I think that that's the kind of approach that people like Deval Patrick, Martha Coakley, Senator Moore have taken. And it's not good for Massachusetts. And we need to do what's good for Massachusetts. Uh, that is something that I will always have a principle in hand. So what do you do to change it? I think you get a waiver. I think that that's the most important thing. You what need does a that governor. Mean to the common people, they hear a waiver. Sure. Basically says, you know, you have a standard under the Affordable Care Act that you should meet, and the governor of the Commonwealth says, we don't want that standard. We're going to go back to the standard we had, so we want a waiver. Get us out of it. And the governor requests it. Um, you know, Governor Patrick has not requested a full waiver in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I know Charlie Baker will. And, you know, Charlie Baker is a friend of mine. I've known him since 2008. He ran in 2010. Unfortunately, he was not successful. But I think he'd be a great governor. And um, I think he gets it a lot, a lot, especially with health care. The guy's a former CEO of Harvard Pilgrim Health Insurance. But at the same time, it's not just about health care. He understands, you know, how to run a state. He's been in state government. He has great experience in that. And he's looking for partners along the way in the legislature who are going to help him implement an agenda, an agenda that says you must have a Social Security number to sign up for these programs or, you know, try to keep taxes down. He just laid out a plan today about how to cut business taxes and to keep Massachusetts more affordable, more accountable and business friendly. And it hasn't been this way. We've had, you know, job losses. You know, some people will say, oh, well, the economy is getting a lot better. I would suggest to the people that they haven't been on the streets, you know, that they haven't really talked to the people, gone to their door. Because I can tell you there's not a lot of people who are feeling great about Massachusetts standing right now. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of frustration out there with the way our state has been led. And that's the kind of the reason why I go and listen to the people. I think it's incredibly important. You know, you can show up at events, and that's nice. And I think tonight we're doing the Taste of Milford, um, which will be exciting. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of people can't afford to go to that event. And so you have to go to those people who are kind of lost, you know, who don't necessarily have kids in the school system or who don't necessarily show up at town meeting, um, who definitely don't go to selectmen's meetings. They're kind of 
in the muddle of Massachusetts. And, you know, that they deserve a voice, too. And they work very hard to make a living here. And every time they turn around, they just get whacked, either with higher taxes or they see, you know, somebody who comes to this country illegally and they get benefits. But if they're struggling, they don't. They don't well, I mean, understand We it. see our local aid every year we hold our breath. Yeah. I mean, we've been lucky in Milford. We've had a surplus for the last 10 years, but mm. it's a small one. Yeah. And we have to squeeze because obviously there's a lot of things that would be nice to do and we don't. Right. How do you get that discipline? I mean, years ago, we voted, the first time I was on the FinCom, line by line on a school budget. Yeah. And I remember shaking my head saying, me telling the superintendent how many rolls of toilet paper he needs does not seem like a good idea. Yeah. Now we've turned around and said, okay, guys, school, you get 61% of our budget. If our total revenue is 100 bucks, here's your 61. You know, not going to argue that you're not the best administrators with the best programs, everything in the world. Mm -hmm. But I got 61 bucks for you. How do we get that discipline? Well, I, you know, I think it goes back to just living like families do. You know, you get the discipline by growing up and making personal decisions on how you're going to live your life. And just one example that I give is my wife and I. Um, about three, four months ago, I lost my car. Um, you know, I don't have a car right now because we can't afford to buy a new car. And we don't want to try to add to our budget of gas insurance, you know, costs of... And you're not taking the $100 a day stipend or whatever. And had I, I could have bought a new car. That's part of the point. You know, I probably could have collected about $27,000 over the last four years. I could buy a brand new Jeep. That's my dream car. <laughs> and, um, you know, but the reality is that you have to live within a budget and you have to set standards. So every Sunday night, my wife and I, we sit down in front of our computer and go through our account. A lot of times she finds herself whacking me upside the head for buying a coffee here or buying a candy yeah, bar there. Yeah, $4 Dunkin' Donuts you right. don't need. Exactly, you know, and, and of course, you know, you make mistakes. But, um, you know, as a general principle, you operate and live within your means. And I think that you set standards and priorities. And, you know, buying a car was not a priority for us because our priority was to pay down our student loans and to pay our rent, you know, to pay for things that really matter, uh, food. And so government has to do the same exact thing. It has to say, what are your priorities? And my priority, number one, would be towns. Because I think that when you consider the six million, six and a half million people who live in Massachusetts, or the 165,000 people who live in this state senate district, what is the form of government that affects them most? Is it the form of government, you know, up in Boston where, you know, the, the bureaucracy is town hard hall. at work? Or is it I the submit it's town hall. Or is it the town hall? Is it the person who's behind that car on a January night or truck plowing the road? Yes, it's that person. Is it the teacher in the classroom who's teaching kids? Yes, it's that teacher. And I think that that has to be made a priority. It's something that I have always made a priority. One of my you know, legislative accomplishments, haven't been around long, don't have a lengthy list of them, but one that I did work very hard on was increasing local aid. Myself, Brad Jones, the minority leader, George Peterson, we took money from a reversion account, money that is basically unspent from the year previous, and said, hey, if it exceeds $100 million, let's take $65 million and give it back to the cities and towns. And, you know, a town of Bellingham gets about $108,000 in increased local aid for the first time in 10 years. Uh, that's, you know, the kind of thing I think we need to be doing and prioritize. Um, you know, town of Milford gets about $200,000 in that uh, equation. So these are good things that I think we can do as legislators and say, this is my priority and this is not. And what I can tell you is not my priority is given benefits to people who come to this country illegally and ignore our laws. And there has got to be something done with it. There's estimates that range. It's, you know, anywhere from $900 million to $1.8 billion. And that's a lot of money. It's also a very big range. But part of the problem is you can't say, oh, you know, if you're in the hospital, are you here illegally? <laughs> you know? But again, even that, if a child is hurting, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us would say turn your back on Absolutely You know what not. I mean? You turn around and you say, to me, there's a very big difference Absolutely. between a child that's in a car accident, a mm -hmm. child that has pneumonia. There's no way I believe any of us would ever look at that child and say, 
I'm sorry. Yep. You don't qualify. I agree. But giving you benefits so you don't have to work? I've got a harder time with that. I have a question for you, too. I've been trying to figure this one out. It does say in the federal law that if you're in an accident, you must be admitted to the emergency room, and that's why we have Mass Health Limited. Mass Health Limited gives health insurance to those who are, you know, not here legally, essentially, or undocumented. And so Senator Moore was on WMRC radio the other day, and he said, and Ed Thompson asked him a question, and that question was, well, do hospitals get reimbursed for people who are illegally here? And the answer was no. So let me ask the question. Why would somebody who doesn't, who's illegally here in Massachusetts need health insurance if the hospital doesn't get reimbursed? Now, I'm confused because I'm involved with the regional medical center. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the worst things Frank Saber could do is let the hospital go bankrupt. Absolutely. Because then he couldn't take care of any of us. Yep. But if we have to absorb costs, when you say reimbursed, mm -hmm. one way or another, I'll submit to you it comes out of this pocket. Yours. Has to. Yep. Has to come from somewhere. Right. E either you give it to them in taxes or my insurance rates go up to absorb. I, I don't understand the so, question. So I'll ask the question again. So Mass Health Limited, it insures people who are illegally here, and it also insures people who are legally here, who are poor. And basically, that's health insurance that they rely upon going to the emergency room. Okay. Okay. So we've. But where's that funding come from? It comes from state government, and which comes from my your, pocket. Exactly. But the question was posed: Do people who are illegally here, when they use that emergency room, illegal immigrants using the emergency room, do hospitals get reimbursed for those costs? And the answer is no. They do not get reimbursed for people who are illegally here. They do not get reimbursed at but the Ryan, emergency room. I have room. to disagree with you because. Or, how can By they the not? The federal government reimburses. The, the argument, you know, they say, oh, illegal immigrants get access to this health care, right. and the federal government mandates it. Okay. okay, unfunded mandate. But the federal government doesn't fund it. Right. So then why do you need health insurance? If no one's going to stop you at the emergency room and say, oh, wait, let me but check your insurance. Somebody has to pay for the Band-Aids and everything they used. But they're not paying for it. You're paying for it. But it's something somebody. So I have insurance for them. Why does Nicholas Guaman need a Mass Health Limited card? If if it only covers well, if emergency, he, if he's illegal, why why would we give him? He has one. anything. Well, he has one. Okay, th then I guess we're saying the same thing because I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute. When anybody goes to the hospital, yep, and they use services, yes, band aids, pens, papers, sutures, whatever, right? Somebody's paying for that. Absolutely. And that somebody feels like my right pocket again. Yep. Absolutely. So what's the point of a card? If, well, that's a great question. So that, and that's actually my point. So why do they need it? Well, is it actually so they get more than just emergency services? And I would say yes. You know, that is the truth. What's happening is it's not just emergency services. Matt, the whole, you know, Department of Health and Human Services wrote a letter to me, and they said, well, Mass Health Limited covers emergency services. Well. No, like you said, we all are very compassionate people and have hearts. If someone's coming in on a stretcher after a car accident, we're not stopping them and well, saying... Well, first of all, I'm not asking for his card anyway. Exactly. We're getting you to the hospital, to the board, and we're operating or we're trying to save your life. Principle number one, right? So my question is, you don't need health insurance for that. No one's asking you for it. So if Mass Health Limited covers only emergency services for illegal immigrants, why do they I'm need confused. a... Why, why do they need why a bother? card? Yeah, exactly. Why do they need a card? And the answer is, it's not just limited services. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Because it's not just to me, an emergency room. It's for other preventative care, and that's not right. And getting the answers from the Patrick administration, and hopefully not the Coakley administration, you know, these are the questions that you ask, and they will not give you a straight answer. So to now me. you're telling me that my mother, who's been here since she was a teenager, who's paid into the system. 70 some years can't get help but so i have to declare her illegal i mean revoke her citizenship i was gonna say if know. i declare her illegal then she can get help yeah i mean it doesn't make any sense this letter just to reiterate and clarify mass health limited is supposed to cover people who are illegally in the united states who have an emergency 
And yet, if you have an emergency and you go there to the hospital, Frank Saber will never turn his door no, closed. No one's turning you away. So why would you need insurance otherwise? You don't. And that's the whole point. And, and yet, they still allow people who are illegally here to sign up. And my, what I would posit is that it's because you're giving access to more than just emergency care. You're looking at preventative care. Um, you're looking at you know going to a general practitioner. And to me, when people are struggling in this country and not having access from the town of Webster, you know, she lost her health insurance for four and a half months. She couldn't see a doctor, you know, and yet somebody who comes to this country illegally, they get to. I just don't think that that's right. You know, it's funny because with a name like Alberto Brans Correa, I do sympathize with people coming to this country because if somebody hadn't had my grandfather, mm. I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. You know, but on the other hand, I keep hearing how we can't take care of our special needs kids, our families, and it's hard for me to rationalize because a fixed pot of money. Yeah. You're taking X dollars out of my pocket. You are. So if you're not putting it towards Milford families that are legal, yeah. then to me you're taking it away from them. Yeah, absolutely. And we live in a world of limited resources and that's where we started this conversation, priorities. What are your priorities? And is it your priority to say we're going to invest in our communities? That's mine. Is it a priority to say we're going to live within our means and not just raise taxes and put more money on the backs of people? That's mine. And is it my priority to say, no, we're not, go we're going to reform the welfare, health care, housing system and say, you know, if you're here illegally, I'm sorry, you're not going to get access to these programs. Go to Rhode Island. <laughs> go, to, go to New York. You know, let them take care of you, but not in Massachusetts. Um, there is an American dream here, you know, and if you want to become an American and be put on that pathway to citizenship, absolutely. But see, there, there again, you just said an American dream. Yeah. You want the dream, be American. You know, very yes. simple. Absolutely. You know, my grandparents went through it. Men, I guess all of our great grandparents are great. You know, you start going backwards, unless you're a Native American. We somewhere along our family, we all have people who went through the legal process. Yeah, and my heart breaks for anybody who, you know, wants to come to this country and get away from a bad situation, or even just, you know, leave a not so good situation where maybe they don't have a job to get a job. I. I sympathize with people like that, but at the same time, like, you know, I look at people who I've met on the campaign trail, knocking on their doors, really struggling, and they have to be the priority. Talk to me about kids, our future, yeah, our children. It's you one of the reasons why I decided to get involved. Um, you know, I, I kind of joke with people that I was nervous about my children, or perhaps even my children's children. Now I kind of feel nervous for myself and my own generation. And one of the things that makes me sad is how few people from my generation step up to the plate. I think there's also this sort of expectation, and I find it to be very disturbing, that when you choose to run for office, if you choose to run against somebody who's been there for a while, that that's not acceptable. You know, who are you? Well, you know, I'm a person with ideas, and I have every right to run. And without people running, there's no accountability. You know, if Senator Moore had no opponent, you know, if, and he voted to raise taxes, he'd basically say, it's fine. You know, I must be doing a great job. There's no opposition to me. Um, voting to raise his own travel reimbursement. It's our right as Americans. Absolutely. But there is, a, there is a, I don't know if it's a glass ceiling or what it might be, but there's a group of people out there who will say, oh, well, you know, you might be a little bit too young or you might be a little bit too inexperienced. And there's a lot of young people out there who f face that, you know, and, and they say, oh, well, why would I get involved? And then they see the flyers that you talked about before that get, you know, are pounding people. And they say, well, why would I want to get involved in that negativity? You know, that, well, they don't I, I can tell you, if you were behind nasty mail coming into my, my yard, hmm. yeah, I don't think I'd be talking to you. Yeah. You know, and that's why I brought it up. The one legitimate question I can see somebody asking is, okay, new versus established. Are we giving up a lot of not having somebody who's been in the seat forever, putting a new guy in who has to learn all ropes, and but you're not that new anyway. I've been there for four years. The ropes aren't too difficult to learn, and uh, you get bounced a 
against them a but lot. How do you answer the question? If somebody not to say, why are you trying to take somebody's job? Because mm -hmm. the last time I looked, nobody owns those seats. Well, the people do. The people do, not the politicians. Mm -hmm. But if somebody was to say, Ryan, why would I choose you over somebody who's established in that role? What would you say? I think it's about voting record. You know, I think you have to look at people and how they vote. And over the last four years, has Senator Moore made it more expensive or more affordable to live here? The answer is he's made it more expensive to live here. Has there been any problems with regards to illegal immigration? Up access to those benefits? And the answer is he's voted against reforms that would kind of shut the door. And like requiring a social security number. Uh, the answer is of the people, by the people, for the people. Who fits that more? Somebody who, you know, basically has voted to double their own travel reimbursement and who and takes that political perk? Or somebody who said no, you know, because it's not right and, you know, it's more supposed to be with the people that don't get that. And I think that's what a lot of people kind of look at in evaluating things. Senator Moore has done good things. You know, there's no question about that. Um, and I've tried to do good things as well. I mentioned the local aid amendment that we were able to get through. We like and, local aid. And actually, he <laughs> and I worked very hard to try to get a law passed together called Michael's Law, um, where, you know, a young man had passed away in my hometown of Sutton. And we wanted to make sure that schools had emergency response plans. You know, those are things that we work on and we'll work on and I'll work with anybody. You know, I don't care party affiliation, conservative, liberal, whatever. If you have good ideas, I want to work with you. But at the same time, what's your big vision for Massachusetts? And if your big vision is, you know, getting $100,000 for the town of Milford out of a budget of $38 billion, you know, I'd rather concentrate on trying to bring taxes down, getting jobs back here, and talking about the 165,000 people who live in this district who have a hard time finding a job. And Senator Moore has not made it easier for businesses to do business here, period. You know, part of that tech tax was his idea, you know, like implementing that. He also voted against requiring the seven days to examine a tax increase, looking at the proposal, and then had to kind of sheepishly repeal it. And that's the kind of government, you know, that I think we've gotten. It's not the kind of government we deserve. People deserve a lot better than that. And the last point I'd make is, you know, you had mentioned new versus experienced, right? You could also put that in terms of past versus future. Now, Senator Morris had a great career. He's been in politics for 44 years. At what point do you say, it's time to pass the torch? And I think it is time to pass the torch. I think that I'm looking forward. I'm not looking backward. And that is the question of this campaign, whether we choose to move forward or look backward, whether people want Massachusetts to be more affordable and accountable, or whether they want to stay with the status quo. And I think that the status quo is no longer good and no longer acceptable and it needs to change. On a more local personal note, sure. people in Milford like to see their legislators. Sure. You know, um, we like to see you around, yeah. taking part in our kids' stuff, in our cultural stuff. Yeah. What kind of a rep would you be for Milford? Great. I love that question. Uh, you know, one of the things I've done as a state representative is go back to the people, to their doors, when I've had the opportunity. You know, in free time on a Friday, I'll knock on people's doors, just like I would when I'm campaigning, and say, what you thinking about? A lot of times they'll invite me in, sit me down at the kitchen table, and just say what's on their mind. Um, but attending events, absolutely. And in fact, you know, if I'm able to find the funding, I'd love to open an office in this town and have a constituent office so that people can come in and they can see me when they need me, have set office hours. And, oh, I think that's one of the advantages of John Fernandez. He's a lawyer in town, so people know if you want to find him, go to his law office. Um, well, you know, the same thing could be true about the state senator. There, I don't believe there's ever been a state senate office in the town of Milford. Um, I'd love to see that happen. We had one for Richie Neal. Congressman. Yes. Yep. But I I'm think they get a about, little bigger budget than you do. <laughs> they definitely get a bigger budget, but we can raise the money and we can make it open. You know, what? it's probably 600 bucks a month. That's not a lot of money. And, you know, having it open periodically or even just having somebody locally donate it, I think that can be a possibility. 
Um, you know, I enjoy dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis, um, listening to their hopes, their dreams, talking about their kids' futures. I've gone to basketball games. I'll probably go to basketball games in Milford. My hometown, Sutton, won't be playing them. We're too small. But I'd love to see the kids successful. It's a good thing because if you start rooting against the yeah, box, we're know. going to be grumpy people. Um, football is another thing. You're going to see me out at football games this campaign, you know, watching the game but also shaking hands as people come in. And, um, you know, I get involved in the schools because I am younger. I'm 30 years old. Um, I'm aging quickly. I point that out. But uh, at the same time, I feel like there's kids that can relate to me. And when I go into their schools, I think I can be effective to talk about what kind of lifestyle that they're going to choose. We could keep going, but I want to give you at least a minute and a half sure. to answer the fundamental question. Yep. I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? You should vote for me because Massachusetts deserves to be a place of opportunity, affordability, and accountability. I have laid out exactly what I believe, that Massachusetts must be a place that people can do business, where entrepreneurs can start and go down to that main street in Milford and say, you know, we're going to start a business right here, that they don't expect to be smacked with another tax that they don't expect. Or, you know, saying that we're going to prioritize Milfordians and people who came here the right way, the immigrants, Georgiana, who I met in Milford, you know, who talked about her struggles getting to this country and then how much time it took and how much money it was. You know, we have to respect those people, and we respect them by implementing policies in this state that reflects them, you know, that says we're going to prioritize you over everything else that you're going to get access to help when you need it, but that people who come here to this country legally, they, they're not going to. We're going to put policies in place that emphasize that, that we're going to say, you know, your politicians are not going to be just above the people, they're going to be of the people. And that, to me, is the most important principle in this campaign. Well, thank you for coming out. Absolutely. And as always, I won't ask you to vote for anybody. I never have. I don't intend to start. What I will beg you to do is get to learn Get to know these candidates. Find out who you feel is more like us and who will represent our values. And then please, I'll beg you, get out to vote. That is the single most important thing I can ask of anybody. Pick somebody, be informed, and then go exercise your voice. Let it be heard. No matter which color you pick, pick one, <laughs> vote, and Milford will get better and better. So as always, may we thank you, and may you. tomorrow be a better day at the center of the universe than today. God bless and good night. Absolutely.